Jung's um, theme or topic of wild connectivities. I think as researchers, we are always looking for wild connectivities because there is noise in the archive. And sometimes these noise needs to be amplified. Um, and we're not when we're not managing budgets, when we're not managing teams, I think this is our vocation. This is what we are set out to do. Um, and so the, uh, the artist archive that we've been working on for the past um, three years or so is um, the archive of this late artist named Ha Bichun. He was a Hong Kong based artist who was knowingly a modernist, self taught, uh, was a sculptor and printmaker whose kind of aesthetic is very collage as you can see, using um, a lot of local materials such as bamboo and wood. He was also a very prolific photographer of exhibitions, so he went around documenting exhibitions. But he also photographed his own work, as well as himself, as you can see in the lower right corner. Um, but you know, his um, photographic work is not as well known as his sculptures and all that. Um, and so when he passed away in 2009, the museum uh, in Hong Kong did a retrospective of his two years later. And of around 82 works in that exhibition, only two of them are photography. And uh, we think it's because it looks like ink. So it got smuggled in to the exhibition. Um, but the focus of um, why we work on this artist's archive is not so much because of his oeuvre, but because of the archive that he amassed uh, single-handedly over 50 years. Um, this is one of the rooms in his former studio, which has now been emptied as part of um, our project. This is another. And this was how the studio looked maybe perhaps three, um, three years ago. Um, <clears throat> and in the past few years, as we are, um, with the generosity of the family, uh, given the permission to access and to process um, these materials, what we found is that um, this archive is a very complex web of practices. Um, of has that not only open up to, um, us to art history through exhibition documentation, but also offer, in a way, a very different lens of looking at the social political context of Hong Kong. As we, this is one of the possibilities of reading that we would like to see. But I'll um, show a little what is inside this archive. 50 years worth of exhibition documentation through photography. And this is in 1963. And these, um, Photography, these exhibition documentation was kept in multiple formats as well. So this is an exhibition album, these are contact sheets, and there are also individual prints. Um, the contact sheets uh, from 1982 to 1997, there are around 3,500 of them. So if you do a little bit of the math, um, it's over 100,000 photographs in those 17 years. And they're organized into albums and pen annotated with invitation cards stuck onto it. And sometimes they're in boxes, and this is one of the boxes that we opened. Um, this is a show from 1977, called First Choice. And um, how documented not only installation shots, but also people who were in it. Um, so there is that possibility of identifying the people, but the question um, that we are always asking is, is it worth it to identify these people? What does it actually serve? What kind of history does it facilitate writing if we go to that length? The placement of the materials in um, this archive also seem to suggest a certain kind of meaning. What you're looking at is um, negatives of um, Haas photography with a year, uh, with an annotation of where he went. Um, so row 120, 1 to 120 in a year, uh, year of 1989. Um, these photo photography uh, materials or documentation also leads us outside of Hong Kong because Ha also traveled and leads us to a bigger art history. He went to Document 10 um, and he was also traveling to other parts uh, of Asia as well as America. And these are just some of um, the, the albums that are in places that are very accessible perhaps suggesting um, that through their physical location, there is an indication of value and use in these materials. Johnson, I warned you that you were in my presentation. This is a younger version of you. Um, but what I wanted to show is actually that each photograph is annotated with numbers uh, of the role of the film, of the year, and 
these photographic um, documentation is as indexical of a record of time that you can get that in context she's you know this is the order of how photographs were taken this is the record of time um, but what Ha would do is also to choose from a certain role a certain event that is the most important to him perhaps and annotate it on um, the top left corner to see this is what this role is about he was also reframing images with um, pieces of paper re-photographing books very often male white artists um, as if he was teaching himself um, this is also what we're speculating as well um, but these photography materials also lead us to a larger web of ephemera that um, perhaps in this context is also more interesting as it opens up to um, a social political world that this archive was inhabiting. Um, so in these boxes are many, many different kinds of magazines which were collected from different sources and um, we think he might have stolen some but there were also, uh, we are tracing some of the sources where he was buying um, these magazines. And there are also images of violence, which I'll speak about later on. <clears throat> but he was also photographing himself with um, his works and also collecting artist portraits. Again, as if he was instructing himself to become an artist. And these you can find um, in many different places across the archive, whether it's in collage books or um, photography, in slides. And you'll see this man did it. Um, it was a carefully constructed series of self-portraits throughout his lifetime. But what we did not expect to find in his 2000 volume strong reference library are these collage books, um, which seems to come from almost a desire to rewrite art history or a desire to rehang spaces as if these interior spaces were not sufficient, that they needed more. And you can see again, the sources come from many different um, images. There are contemporary sources, there are also art historical sources. All of these materials are being scanned and digitized and shared online. This is a particular um, collage book called Ink Revelations. And, um, the art historically less acute eye might kind of just see that, okay, this may pass in an Asian um, ink work, but it's actually a work by the Italian um, painter, um, Garapassi. And inside you see more juxtapositions of pretty wild connections um, of Asian artists with non-Asian artists. Even Africa, there is Africa in there. Ying and Yong and Matisse. Liu Shuquan on the top left, a uh, Hong Kong painter. But sometimes they just seem to be kind of visual play, um, manipulating the archival images, uh, playing with the book form as well. And of course, he inserted himself into this alternative art historical canon, uh, if you can read it that way. And I think there's a, a real liberation in. Um, working with the archive like that and to be kind of um, be accessing the archive as someone who comes after and to be able to have this liberty to do different readings. Um, but situating back this archive into a larger political context is uh, this box that we found um, during the Umbrella Movement um, on the year 1967 in Hong Kong. 1967 was an important year for Hong Kong because it was the year when um, pro-China communist um, groups were trying to start a chapter of the Cultural Revolution in Hong Kong through rioting, through um, bombing the city uh, with um, homemade bombs, and um, they were not successful. And we found this particular uh, magazine or a propaganda leaflet in Ha's um, archive, and this was actually a publication by one of the pro-leftist uh, newspapers called who is, who is guilty of these atrocities? And at the back, you know, this is actually an image of what was happening at the time in Hong Kong. Um, we found this during um, the Umbrella Movement when um, it just happened. And what struck us was the similarity of the images um, and how they're being manipulated as a reminder that, you know, in the end, we, 
do get manipulated by um, the media regime, even though we are trying to involve ourselves in direct action. Um, but what it also reminds us is that there is possibility of rereading these images, um, even as they are lying dormant in an archive, just performing their primary function, accumulation and storage. When the time comes, there will be uh, a time and a possibility of rereading. There are even more um, newspaper clippings, um, just spreads of newspaper from during that year, from 1966 kind of through 1967. Um, and manipulated, very different from how um, how was working with his other images. This, these are just in a box. So what what was he trying to do? What function is this serving? Um, he was also collecting other ephemera uh, related to, I guess, around the 60 of that time of that social unrest in different languages. This is from a Chinese magazine. There are ones on in Japanese. This is also on the Cultural Revolution in French. There's also a ton of illustrated London news. So perhaps through collecting, um, this one person was inhabiting different worlds and he was also creating different worlds and offering us different ways of rereading and inhabiting this world that I think is very confusing at the moment because of the violence, because of um, all of the things that are out of our control. And even Africa was sort of in the center of the world at the time. And this is an image from um, 1969, um, speculating on what might happen in the next year. And I think this is actually a really um, powerful image in a way where you see geography um, and sizes can be manipulated and different imaginations can be spawned. Um, and so now I'll shift gears to kind of how we've been working with um, this particular archive. Um, this is an image from a small um, display or an exhibition that we did in a library space on this particular archive, inviting the public to engage with it. And it's called Excessive Enthusiasm, um, Habitation and the Archive as Practice. Um, in this little exhibition, we showed um, some of the original materials that we think can open up public conversations. Um, we also reproduced some of the contact sheets um, that were in a way kept very carefully selected to make sure that people would be able to identify with it. Um, certain people will find themselves in it as a way also to just entice certain conversations. And what we also did is um, you know, the archives have to be activated collectively, and what better than working with students? So uh, we worked with um, a group of architecture students um, from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, asking their teacher, who's the architect we were working with designing the exhibition, to say, look, what would you like to do? And they said, we would like to open a box and to see if we can reconstruct an exhibition. And that's exactly what they did. Um, apart from Ha's documentation, there were no other references. So there were also other research being done to find the footprint of the building that's no longer there. Uh, a lot of photoshopping so that the works actually um, look the way that they should. Um, and Ha, of course, photographed himself in this exhibition. And this was what the students did as well. So they put him back in. And I think these are elements of surprises that when you lose in your grip, when you let the archive go, it actually comes back with more. I'll actually um, skip this because this is another um, another way of activating archive is to work with artists and this is an artist project that we've done with Walid Rad where he um, transformed some of the archive uh, some of past collage pages into a three uh, dimensional kind of little perspective diagram and this is the little shoeboxes living in a library a few months ago another painting. Um, but a little update on that project is what has been happening next. Um, we are fully funded for the next three years to process and share and circulate um, these materials. And one of our kind of modest aspirations is to also build a community around these archival materials, and not necessarily in Hong Kong, but also internationally, to critically engage with it, to think with it, to think through it, because this is an archive that can open up so much more than just Hong Kong history. It's also about archival methodologies. It's all about um, building communities and collective memories. Um, the condition of the studio was not great. 
for one very nice July afternoon, we decided that we would move it with a lot of boxes and a lot of people packing. Yes, I'm almost done. Um, these are my colleagues from Asia at our archive, without whom I, uh, none of this would happen. Um, this is, in a way, we almost consider this. Uh, the move perhaps can be a beginning of a collective practice um, that emotionally would not crush us, but would actually enable us to do so much more. Um, this is the widow, and this is how who still lives across from um, the Habichin's Chin, Hab former um, studio. And without her, we wouldn't have any of this. So um, the studio was actually on the top floor of a walk-up, an, an old building in Hong Kong. So everything was moved down manually. Um, yes, the laborers were not happy. Uh, we filled a 5.5 ton truck three times because um, there was so much stuff. And we now have rented a project space dedicated to this archive for the next three years. And one of the biggest challenge is to find it a permanent home next three years because this needs a proper institution taking care of it, whether it's conservation, exhibition, um, and access for not only scholars, but also the public. You know, like you, you pack one layer of stuff and then you find another layer of stuff. Um, but this is just to illustrate how much uh, we're doing. And this is the studio as we left it. And where the boxes now live. I think there's a very different materiality to it. But, um, and some people might lament that the archive is different. The archive has lost its charm. But I would like to propose that this is a new beginning. And um, as I said earlier, it's, it's a possibility of a collective practice that promises something else. And it is through trying and doing and experimenting that we'll be able to find something else. Yeah, and so, you know, like the first box we opened, and then we already found something else. Um, and um, I am always constantly reminded by this conversation I've had with an artist in Hong Kong who said, um, it's by, so sometimes it's by doing something finite that you can actually allude to the infinity. Um, and by opening one box, you can actually go through different frames of past and presence and futures. And um, I think for, an archive which was gathered together by one man, um, kind of single-handedly. I think we should almost kind of consciously push against that one person um, effort and make it into a collective one. Because something of this excessive enthusiasm should be shared, um, can only be shared and have a different life if it's shared with um, equally ferocious curiosity. And I'll end it here, thank you so much. invites other archivists to join his archive, and then they all travel together. He's done in four countries so far. But what's very interesting was about his gallery exhibition had nothing to do with what that. He, and during this, he uncovered this amazing life that in the 1920s, a man from Nigeria came to Warsaw and tried to be a jazz musician. He loved Poland, learned Polish, married a Polish woman, stopped music, and became a worker. When the Nazis came to power, he joined the Polish resistance as a Pole. Uh, he's completely erased from history. So what um, Rzeszewski has done, he's done 12 portraits, large portraits of this man. And this group, this was a house filled with portraits of this black man. They also like in the Polish resistance uniform, holding a gun and everything. Now, at the same, a couple of months later, earlier, the National Museum of Poland has, has uh, closed for uh, renovation. Now, now they want new things in it. So they came to the gallery. And they bought one of the portraits, but what they said is the only ones we can't show are the ones where he's holding a gun because it would be too political to sh show a black man with a gun, even though he was fighting the Nazis. <laughs> but but what's, what's amazing about this is that they bought this huge, beautiful portrait. And when the, the, the museum reopens in the spring, this portrait will be in the gallery of Polish heroes. So that's a kind of you know wonderful story that we we need. need. Um, What's the name of the artist? The, uh, our name is Karol Radziszewski. I'll I'll write it down for you, and I can show you his website too because it's, it's 
amazing. And he's actually written a history of this band, too. Now. Okay, so one of the things that I think that's important here is historiography t t tells us not only just what happened, but what happens to what happened. And what happens to what happened is what makes future possible, makes our lives possible, and liberates meanings. So, what, um, uh, I just have a couple examples. One, of, I'm mostly involved in cinema, and I was just thinking about examples from Korean cinema that remember incorrectly. I don't mean facts, I mean the way they remember uh, is not uh, auspicious, and then there's some that are auspicious. Let me give you uh, one example of a, of a bad memory, a bad memory. It's actually called Lost Memories, 2000, 2009 Lost Memories. It's a science fiction uh, based on this novel, I think it was called Searching for My Epitaph. But in, in that, they posit an alternate history where Japan had won the war, and Korea is a, co is a permanent colony of Japan. But then this hero goes back in time and uh, ch changes everything so we get the Korea we know now. Now, what, what I think is wrong with that is that the Korea we know now is a happy ending, right? The ha this hero brought back all the dictatorships, brought back Park Chung-hee, and, and, but this time we're supposed to be happy about it, right? That's a bad memory, right? But one of the things they did right was they, sh they showed a, a whole stream of series of incidents, historical incidents that lead up to 2009. Some of them were real, and others of them were fake. Now, I compare that to a, a film from 1980 called uh, Nambukun, you know, the Southern uh, Army. It also begins with a, a series of historical events that leads up to that point. Of course, those are all true. What's interesting about it is that the fake ones actually stimulate historiographical responses. The real one is meaningless, because <laughs> all just listing events cannot explain Korean history, right? So, but then just, just one, oh, just two more examples. Um, one, uh, uh, this, my response to this is actually inspired by Professor Kim Soyoung. I think that Professor uh, Kim is the only person who's given Peppermint Candy a bad review, which it so desperately deserves. <laughs> you know? Um, but, you know, it's, it's a flashback, a series of flashbacks from the, guy, the day the guy commits suicide to you know, his innocence. What I think that is horrible about that kind of restructuring of history, it exonerates a criminal that was part of the, you know, the, the Kobanju massacre. And that kind of re-editing is a kind of erasure of responsibility that is shocking. And I, it's, I'm surprised that there are such a handful of people who have recognized that. But, so, but lastly, uh, this is the one I would like to have the good news. There's one Korean film I think that is the most wonderful way of remembering history. It's a hard film. Uh, it's called um, The Last Witness. From, also from 1980, uh, Yi Yong, which is based on a novel, a very important novel. That investigates Korean, uh, Korean history as a murder mystery. And it actually shows when the, he's, he's running, you know, this, this, this sort of failed detective is going through decayed landscape. He really shows that the unsolved mystery of Korean history is one of the things that causes the, the kind of despair and incoherence that keeps erupting. It's absolutely brilliant. Then, oh, I show just one last one. It's called The Last Witness. Yeah. And it's been remade, but I want to I want to see the remake. This 1980 is the real one. Uh, but then also, even in this sort of glossy, um, beautifully done film called The Good Lawyer's Wife, Paranam Pato, um, it's, it's about you know a marriage failing into decadence. But what re it's really about is like Jeju Massacre and things like that. Remember, the opening scene is them unearthing the bodies. And I think that unearthing the bodies and still remaining silent is a kind of sickness that is all permeating this also. But let me open the floor to all, you know, questions and responses from the writers. Uh, we'd like to go first. <laughs>
Reiteration of the uh, BCN. Uh, I found the presentation of Jane Jin Kaizen very interesting and appealing uh, through a multi channel video installation. Uh, reiteration of the BCN began in two, uh, 2011. She reveals that the repressed histories of the Jeju April 3rd uh, resistance and massacre, thus, redefining already existing knowledge production system and creating new form of uh, social knowledge. I have no objection uh, to her presentation and I fully agree with her idea. But I just need to supplement her idea. Uh, especially, I come to resonate with her when she focuses on the discrepancies that tend to exist between official state narratives and the people's count memories. She said in her presentation that she was compelled to engage with the legacy of the Jeju April 3rd event as the part of the past, which actively shapes the present, even if though, um, through a sense of haunting, since that past has been silenced and repressed. I want to supplement her idea by suggesting that what Jack Derrida calls inheritance or death in his book Spectres of Marx might be helpful in Jane Jim Cajun's strong idea. I think Derrida. Uh, Upshot is very clear. A certain spirit of Marx have remained to haunt the world uh, even after the collapse of the Soviet Union. For Derrida, the object we, we inherit is not so much knowledge or theoretical understanding as Marx's spirit was practiced to the extent that Jane Jing Heisen centers on uh, the importance of haunting the discrepancies between official state narratives and the people's count memories and the finally, how they coexist, co -exist. I just suggest that uh, what the already develops in Spectre's Marx will be helpful. So I just suggest her to develop the idea by thinking of what we need to inherit from the uh, repressed histories of the Jeju April 3rd event. Okay, uh, the, my uh, next uh, comment is on the Michel Wang's uh, AAAA, a Harvey Trans Materials Documenting 96 Riots. Uh, uh, an archive goes beyond the documentary preser uh, preservation. This is not simply as historical repositories, but as complex processes of knowledge production. As Michel Wong uh, rightly demonstrated in the case of AAA and the Harvey Chen's archiving practice, archives contribute not only to collecting the fragmented past, but also to creating the social memory. That is, archives does refer to artifacts of uh, culture that lead us to think of who we are. Uh, within this context, I think that an archive needs to be conceived not only as documentary preservation, but also as a style of social knowledge production, which uh, redistributes to what is known and what is knowable. So within this uh, context, my question is as follows. Were they organized by the state, public, or private entities? Archives anyway collect the materials of the past that are never lived in isolation. Uh, within this context, to which extent do archives play a role in the process of social knowledge production? To put it otherwise, to which extent do archives explicitly or implicitly structure certain kinds of social understanding? And uh, my final question is, what, what particular forms of social knowledge are specific to archives, including AAA? 어, 다음 두 분한테는 한국말 어, 좀 질문을 하고 싶습니다. 그 어, 임지원 선생님한테 좀 질문을 좀 어, 드리고 싶은데요. 선생님의 발표 굉장히 흥미롭게 아주 잘 들었습니다. 그 어, 특히 각각의 개별적인 어떤 역사적 트라우마가 연결되는 그런 방식들에 관해서 말씀을 해주셨고 어, 그것이 굉장히 인상적이었습니다. 
이제 며칠 전에 최종봉 선생님, 선생님께서 말씀해 주신 것이기도 한데 아, 그것이 일종의 어떤 커넥션이 가지고 오는 어떤 불안과 공포 때문에 지금 현 어떤 상황 속에서 어떤 그 뭐라 그럴까 디스커넥션의 어떤 상황들이 또 약이 되고 있는 어떤 그런 이 아주 변질법적인 복합적인 관계가 있기 때문에 이런 상황에서 커넥션과 디스커넥션의 관계를 어떻게 정립할 것인가의 문제가 좀 굉장히 심각하게 다가온 것 같고요. 그런 차원에서 각각의 개별적인 역사적 트라우마를 제어할 때 이것이 어, 아까 선생님께서 말씀하셨던 것처럼 우리의 트라우마가 더 비참하다, 우리의 트라우마가 더 가혹하다라는 것을 계속해서 증명하는 방식으로 전개되는 것들 일종의 어떤 민족주의적인 어떤 방식으로 어, 트라우마, 역사적인 트라우마를 재용토하는 어떤 그런 것에 굉장히 강하게 문제를 제기하셨고 저는 그런 차원에서 이거를 일종의 좀 약간 어, 어떠한 일종의 어, 원리랄까 혹은 원칙이랄까 이런 것에 근거해서 이 특수한 것과 어떻게 보면 이것이 연결되고 있는 어떤 그런 것들을 정립할 수 있는 그런 원칙이나 원리 같은 것들을 우리가 어떻게 상상할 수 있는 것인가 이런 것에 관해서 조금 답변을 해주시면 좋을 것 같습니다. 그게 있고요. 그 다음에 아, 이용우 선생님 같은 경우에는 네, 그 백표 잘 들었습니다. 그 역사화하고 일종의 집합적 기억을 보존하는 어떤 그런 것으로서 문화 혹은 어떤 케이팝의 역할에 대해서 어, 문제 제기를 하셨고요. 어, 그런 면에서 지금 어, 대중문화의 어떤 그런 현상들 속에서 어, 지금 세월호의 그 사건들을 지금 어, 표상하고 재현하는 어떤 그런 방식들이 어, 형성되고 있는 것을 어, 말씀해 주셨습니다. 어, 그런데 제가 조금 약간 궁금했었던 것은 이 트라우마틱한 이벤트를 어, 상징화하고 역사하는 것의 중요성은 어, 충분히 공감하지만 그것들을 조금 더좀 어, 세분화해서 조금 분배해서 어, 설명하는 것이 필요하지 않을까라는 생각이 들고요. 기존의 어, 이 지금 이제 대중적인 어떤 표상의 체계 가운데 어, 이 분배가 지금 어떻게 형성이 되고 있는 것인가 어, 일종의 어떤 이 일종의 이것도 감각적인 것이라고 할수 있는 것인데 이 감각적인 것들의 분배가 어떻게 형성이 되고 있는 것이고 지금 그 속에서 지배적인 어떤 경향들은 어떻게 나타나고 있고 지금 마이너한 경향들은 어떻게 또 나타나고 있고 무엇이 가시화되고 있으면서 또 무엇이 비가시화되고 있는지 혹은 가시화와 비가시화 사이의 어떤 그런 관계는 무엇인가에 대해서 조금 더 세분화해서 말씀해 주시면 도움이 될것 같습니다. 이상입니다. 네. 어, I have two, two remarks from all and from all and then my response to all is a certain point is that It, your, your remarks raise certain very important question about the relationship between memory and responsibility. I mean, usually in, in East Asia, people used to think in terms of uh, certain um, what can I say? collective guilt. So you Japanese, okay, if, if you are Japanese, you should be responsible for what happened in the Second World War, even though you were not born at that time. Right? So this is very much violent logic, logically very much violent. I cannot, I cannot accept that way of thinking. But even though those young Japanese who were born in 1990s, even 1990s, they don't have any responsibility for what happened in the Second World War, but they have a responsibility for remembering what happened. Because remembering is an act that is now happening. with their involvement, right? So I think that this, even the post-war generation have a responsibility for remembering what happened or ways of remembering. So this is first point. And second point is involvement. The, I think this is the point that has some more specific raised in, the, in our approach to coming to terms with the past in Japan. It means that, let me take an example of Korean case, okay? If we, some of you are flying uh, Korean Airlines, Right? I don't fly Korean Airlines, but anyway. So, <laughs> Korean Airlines and the Cal, they had benefited from their involvement in the Vietnamese war. So, so many Korean, the young generation who were born even after the Vietnamese war, 
in some sense, they are benefiting from the existence of Carl Korean Airlines or Hanjin or something like that. Then, what kind of relationship should those Koreans who were born in 1980s after the war uh, the keep towards the Hanjin and if, if especially if he is an employee at Hanjin or some of us are benefiting from flying Korean Airlines, what kind of responsibility do we have for Hanjin's you know, uh, involvement in the Vietnamese war? So this, these two kinds of responsibilities raises really important questions, important points in our attitude for the past. And my response to Sumo, Hangumalo. <laughs> 원칙은 없는 것 같아요. 그러니까 컨텍스트가 제일 중요할 것 같아요. 원래 내가 히스토리안이라서 그런지 모르겠지만 어떤 하나의 원칙에 맞춰 갖고 이렇게 공식으로 이렇게 기억하는 것이 옳은 것이 아니라 컨텍스트에 따라 달라질 것 같아요. 아까 어리 그 나이지리아 그 아프리카 어, 그 사람으로 폴란드의 그 레지스탄스에 그 아마도 아르미아 끄라요바라고 불리웠던 그 레지스탄스 조직일 텐데. 사실 아르미아 끄라요바는 굉장히 레이시스트 그룹이거든요. 그 반유대주의자들도 굉장히 많이 거기 들어가 있는 조직인데 그럼에도 불구하고 이 사람들이 유대인 또 구출을 하는 제거타라는 조직에 가입을 하는데 왜냐하면 유대인을 구하고 싶어서 구하는 게 중요한 게 아니라 폴란드 민족의 명예를 위해서 유대인들을 구하는 굉장히 그런 복잡한 복합적인 것들이 있는데 결국 메모리에서 우리가 주의해야 될 거는 그와 같은 굉장히 다양한 함의를 가지고 있는 그러한 액션을 어떻게 기억하느냐는 역시 컨텍스트가 중요합니다. 또 하나 예를 든다면 홀로코스트의 유니크티스에 대한 담론 같은 건데 예컨대 1980년대 독일에서 그 히스토리크 스트라이트라고 불리우는 역사가 논쟁이 벌어졌을 때 독일의 우파들이 홀로코스트를 상대화하려고 합니다. 왜냐하면 스탈린주의의 범죄를 어, 끄집어 올리면서 스탈린주의 볼셰비즘의 위협에 맞서서 나치 독일이 유럽 문명을 말하자면 보호하려고 했다는 나치의 논리를 끄집어 들면서 그러니까 스탈린주의의 범죄도 이뭐 이러, 나치보다 더 많이 죽였다. 폴로코스 600만 밖에 안 죽였는데 예컨대 스탈린주의 때 2천 만이 죽었다. 그렇다면서 그것을 폴로코스 상대화하는 맥락에서는 폴로코스트의 유니크니스, 폴로코스트 독특한 거고 스탈린주의 범죄와 비교해서는 안 된다라는 논의가 설득력이 있지만 그런데 포스트 콜로니아라는 맥락에서 홀로코스트의 유니크니스를 강조하다 보면 그럼 유럽의 식민주의가 벨기에 식민주의가 콩고에서 천만을 죽였는데 여러분 홀로코스트의 그 크라임만 중요한 혹은 그것만이 다른 어떤 제노사이드와 비교할 수 없을 정도로 주, 중요하다라는 유니크니스 담론을 얘기하게 되면 사실은 그 유럽 식민주의의 제노사이드와 제노사이드라는 큰 맥락 속에 홀로코스트를 위치시키고 그것을 상대화하려는 그 같은 역사적 맥락을 잃어버리게 되는 거죠. 그러니까 똑같은 똑같은 그 기억하는 방식과 기억하는 문법이 같은 문법인데 어떠한 로케이션에 그것이 놓여지냐에 따라서 역사적 의미와 사회적 의미와 실천적 의미가 달라진다는 거죠. 그렇기 때문에 이거 뭐이 어떤 수학적 공식을 가지고 이 메모리를 집어넣기보다는 훨씬 더 어렵죠. 사실 공식 하나 외우면 편한데 모든 컨텍스트마다 그때 그때의 구체적인 역사적 조건들을 굉장히 면밀히 다 따져 봐야지 우리가 선생 밸런스 그러니까 밸런스된 그러한 그 편에 가질 수 있다. 그 정도가 제일. It's also a call for uh, trying to imagine uh, living otherwise and, and more justly, uh, not just as in, in this kind of truth and reconciliation aspect, but more as a kind of aspiration for, I guess, like when I think about it as a kind of uh, like what, what does an ethical memory mean 
know, how can we, uh, we might not achieve it, but we can work towards it uh, and to, like uh, try to, to listen to ghosts and, and try to understand, especially, I mean, I guess the way I think about it is kind of like, uh, to invoke the ghosts or to try to listen to them also has to do with uh, thinking about like their un unrealized aspirations. You know, so that's where the, the past and the present are in kind of uh, constant active negotiation if we uh, bring the ghosts into the conversation. Uh, it, uh, um, it requires a kind of more uh, um, whole uh, consideration of, of the member, you know, because it, it requires sort of uh, taking the other into the conversation. Um, so I guess, like, I mean, I guess the way that it has uh, been meaningful to me in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, thinking alongside Spectres of Mars has been sort of trying to think about in, in a kind of uh, you know what what does what does that mean in terms of uh, uh, dealing uh, artistically with um, an issue like uh, uh, April third and, and I guess some of the ways that I have been trying to negotiate that is uh, yes yeah, through this kind of. Uh, Channel installation are trying to like create other forms of narratives that I would hope would allow for uh, a kind of uh, attentive listening uh, beyond sort of like the, the official narratives. Uh, yeah, I guess that's how it has uh, it's been meaningful to me and, and to try to continue to. Uh, Think alongside. I mean, it's, it's not like it's, that, that memory is not final, but it's something yeah, that, that has to be re invoked and recalled constantly. So, I'm also going to speak in Korean just because it's my mother tongue, and I'm really like having a hard time for the Japanese. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it's better to stay in Korean. So, um, uh, the comment about 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 the 촉박해 되는 어떤 문화적인 정동의 층위들 그런 것들을 좀 살펴보고 싶었고 그리고 그것들이 만들어내는 특정한 어떤 윤리학적 어, 이야기들이 아니라 굉장히 다양한 시장의 문화들의 층위들 안에서 놓여지는 어떻게 보면 케이팝이라는 가장 그 대중적인 장르 자체가 어떻게 그 장르 자체를 스스로가 능동적으로 이 포레티컬한 정치적인 장에 개입하고 노인의 장을 만들어내는가에 대한 문제의 지점들을 좀 설명을 하고 싶었고요. 그리고 방금 말, 말씀하셨던 어떤 그 세분화와 분배에 대한 설명들 그리고 이 연구 안에서 이것들이 어떻게 어, 연구적인 한계로 읽혀지는가에 대한 이유는 이 사건 자체가 2014년도에 일어났고 그거에 대한 그 문화적인 어떤 레지리언스라든지 레프레젠테이션의 문제들이 지금 한국 사회에서 굉장히 리지드한 정치적, 정치적인 상황이고 그것을 문화적으로 표상화시키는 것에 대한 어떤 문화인들의 두려움들, 콜렉티브, 아, 어떤 피어니스가 있어요. 그리고 그런 것들의 문제 때문에 이 케이팝 안에서 굉장히 그, 그, 하이 메타포리컬하게 어, 설, 설명이 되었고 그래, 그렇기 때문에 2014년, 2015년, 2016년도에 케이팝 안에서 만들어지고 있는 어떤 다양한 지층들을 보고 싶었는데 그래서 2014년도 같은 경우에는 가장 직접적인 트라우마타이즈 된 어디언스 즉, 예를 들어서 그 이, 이 TV를 통해서 그런 트라우마틱 이벤트를 관람하고 있는 다양한 한국 사람들에 대한 얘기 그게 2014년도에 나왔던 그 케이팝 포레시스의 어떤 문제들이었고요 두 번째는 그렇기 때문에 그 세월호의 가족에 대한 얘기를 
good uh, one year commemoration period. There is a, a story about the Passover incidents, uh, family victims, right? So, 개인의 기억이나 공유로서의 문제로서의 어떤 K-pop의 문제들 그리고 제일 마지막에 얘기했던 것은 이게 굉장히 재밌는 다양한 층위가 있어요. 제일 처음에는 우리들 직접적으로 우리가 그, 그 TV를 보면서 그걸 보고 있는 사람들 두 번째는 세월호의 가족들 그리고 제일 마지막 2016년도에 드디어 빅팀에 대한 빅팀의 시선으로 그것을 그 바라보는 어떤 케이팝 버리시스가 나왔던, 나왔던 거거든요. 그래서 저는 이러한 어떤 그 트레젝토리 문화적인 트레젝토리나 그 리프레젠테이션의 그 캐리버리세이션 자체가 굉장히 재밌는 부분들을 보여주고 있다고 생각해요. 누가 가장 채, 처음으로 바라할 수 있는가에 대한 얘기들 그리고 이 트라우마에 대한 문제 자체가 제일 처음으로 바라할 수 있던 사람들은 거기에 직접적으로 개입되지 않는 어디언스로 남아있는 한국 한국 집합들이에요. 그리고 그두 번째로 얘기할 수 있는 것은 One Year Commemoration이니까 그 다음에는 그런 어떤 그 Popular Resilience나 Movement 자체가 굉장히 활발하게 일어났으니까 시민사회에서 그렇기 때문에 드디어 빅팀의 얘기를 할수 있게 되었고 2015년도에 그리고 마지막 2016년도에 드디어 그 유령의 시선으로 이그 가수들의 목소리로 그 빅팀들의 얘기가 드디어 나왔던 거거든요. 그래서 저는 이런 어떤 남한 사회의 집단적인 우울증 자체가 굉장히 자기 자신의 목소리를 한 세기 동안 거의 한 세기 동안 거세시켜 놓고 굉장히 그런 기억들을 간직하거나 의도적으로 어떤 망각해온 근대 역사 속에서 이런 레이어들 그리고 빅팀을 캐러브라이징 하는 그, 그 방식 자체들이 이미 시스템화 됐다고 생각해요. 이미 대중 기억들이나 대중이 그것을 어떤 리인터프리테이션 하는 과정 안에서도 그래서 그런 것들을 좀 특별하게 얘기를 해보고 싶었습니다. 네. 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 First intention, I guess, behind A is that there is the belief that art is knowledge. Art is a form of knowledge, and therefore the art history, the history of art, and the study of it is worthy. Um, and I think, therefore, then there is this value then in accessing or amassing and making available resources, uh, materials for people's questions in themselves that um, through practice we can begin to address them. Um, and so the way that I think we are trying to do is, um, well, we were founded in year 2000, so we were 16 years, we were a teenager. There's a lot of growing pains. Um, but what I think what we're trying to do is also to develop very context-specific um, projects um, that is by no means comprehensive. But I think what you can compensate, uh, that what breath cannot do, depth can compensate. And I think um, in, in a certain way, um, if you go deep enough um, on a subject, and there will be other connectivities that actually allow you to see not only yourself, but other people. Um, and so I'm trying to think of um, maybe one project as, uh, as an example, which is actually not an archiving project, but a bibliography project that my colleagues in India have been doing. And India um, is also a modern construct. Right? We cannot divorce ourselves from modernity. And especially if you're looking at recent art, modernity, and colonialism, and post-colonialism is something that you are dealing with or living within, um, kind of a priori, or kind of in, in the very, very beginning. And so um, in this bibliography project, what uh, my colleagues uh, had done over a year and a half is to run this kind of a marathon race um, of researchers going through libraries in regions, in different regions, because this is a bibliography of modern and contemporary art in India at the time, and now it's expanded to South Asia because languages also travel, um, of uh, modern and contemporary art in South Asia in the past hundred years for in 14 languages. Um, so what they did was to have these regional researchers um, going through regional libraries, actually then going through library catalogs um, to amass this bibliography, and then we realize actually a bibliography is perhaps not alive enough, and what you can actually make it live is to by doing university workshops. And that again, you know, in a way removes the organization away from what an archive is, but I think the whole point is also to rethink 
what an archive is and what an archive can do, apart from serving only um, academics and curators. Um, what can it do in terms of building infrastructure, um, in terms of knowledge production infrastructure, as well as community that will um, use it? Sort of out of time, but I think that we should we should have at least one or two questions. So um, I just wanted to comment on uh, Professor Lee's statement. Um, or the connection he made, you know, which I found very interesting. Of course, uh, Du Bois's travel to to Poland and what he he wrote about uh, later on, and uh, I mean. Because he, he laments the situation of the world. And then he says what he draws from that, actually, is not very much about, uh, you know, what he calls the, 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 the problem of the Jews, but to him the Negro problem. You know, so he kind of makes an entanglement, you know, which I find very interesting, you know, because there are technologies of certain things, you know. So the technology of the Holocaust is a similar technology that was used in the um, in the kind of extermination of the Armenians in Turkey. But it's also the same kind of technology that was used by the Germans on the Hereros and the Namas in Namibia, you know. So there's a continuity in certain things, you know. So I really find this entanglement, this kind of connections you made very interesting. And I think that's how we, we should look at the world. Uh, then um, a statement also on uh, Professor Lee's um, presentation, which I, I also found very interesting. Again, so how certain incidents influence pop culture. But then uh, what I even find more interesting, in, and it's something I've been, I've been working on in the past years, is how then culture then turns to impact or leave an impact in subjectivities and space. You know, so we listening to that sound, what does that do to us? You, you know, so it, it is this cycle, you know, so I, I find that maybe that should be explored even more. Not only, you know, how this flows into culture, but how, how it, it reverberates, you know, and come, this comes back, it comes back to us, you know. And then, uh, last thing, uh, uh, Michelle, we've talked about that yesterday, again, the performativity of the archive, you know, which is something we all have to continue thinking about, you know. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comment. Perhaps I think I can add just one more small anecdote regarding uh, Du Bois in Poland. Actually, he visited Poland twice. At the turn of 20th century, when he was a doctoral student in Berlin, he visited uh, Poland and the Galicia, yeah? It's a Polish Galicia. And then, at that time, he left a very interesting uh, this memory that the, there was no taxi in the small town in Galicia, so he took the car to driver, right? And so, oh, I, I need a hotel accommodation, and then, Cut the driver said, oh, I know one hotel that is run by one of your people. And he led the two boys to the hotel run by a Jew in Malaysia. <laughs> so this is really, really interesting anecdote. And I think that this means that this, his second visit to Warsaw Ghetto is also related with these sort of things, right? It's also foreigners and strangers in those East European small, small towns. But so also, um, yes, yes, this, I think that the German, even Nazi German occupation policies in the Poland is a typical colonial policy in, in Africa. For example, it was not allowed for Poles to have cameras and typewriters. It was not allowed for Poles to go to theaters and kinos. These guys, you know, savages, these Slavs. And the Hitler explicitly wrote that the demarcation line between Asia and Europe is the, the, is the, the boundary when this, uh, the Germandom ends and Slavdom uh, begins. So Slavs has been always Asians or a sort of, you know, natives by Germans, especially by the Nazi ideologies, ideologues. So I mean that even, even the post-colonial perspective is not just about the 
uh, Europe and the non-European countries' relations, but also Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. So post-colonial approach in this sense, even the, in the European studies, we need post-colonial perspective. Uh, thank you for the, yeah. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Like I like to focus this on the K-pop because K-pop is actually like when it shifts to the global markets and it like making a kind of like very active um, various questions like in relation to ethical or political and even like um, a strategic questions in relation to um, the, the what is this specific meaning cultural syndromes and symptoms which is composed of a specific domains of the real or imagined or sometimes very much like um, hybrid or cross fertilized cultural fields in relation to the um, K-pop um, you know, uh, movement. So in this representation, I would like to focus this on this kind of cultural reinterpretation of these specific traumatic events in relation to the sulfur incidents. Because the most of the people during the times, the, the audiences, especially the Koreans, there were several layers of reinterpreting this specific cultural um, the